carbon-14 in real time in trees. Uh, I'm going to give you an introduction and it's going to start out with an article that I uh, wrote and got published in Origins and um, there's, I'm not going to read you the whole article obviously uh, but it will give a, it will give you some of a quick summary of what we're looking at and also point out that this is not something that uh, uh, the, the predictions that are made were done before any of the data was uh, collected that you will see today. There are eight categories of models for converting carbon-14 dates into real time. We'll dis be discussing those. Six of these models are based on creation as described in Genesis and a short age of life on Earth. Differences between the models are specified, especially those that are subject to experimental testing. Such features include, one, differences between ring years and radiocarbon years in trees that should be immediately post-diluvian by creationist theories. And uh, that's the major one we'll discuss. The accuracy or lack thereof of the dendrochronological radiocarbon calibration curve in the historical era, that's another a whole section and we're not going to be discussing that today uh, unless it gets brought up in the discussion afterwards. And three, the possible existence of carbon-14 and antediluvian fossil material, which is the one that most of you probably know of my work in. Uh, suggestions are offered for experimental projects that would resolve these uncertainties. Uh, I begin by saying in this paper I will discuss eight categories of carbon-14 models and their experimental implications. Six or three quarters of these are creationist models. The purpose of this paper is to stimulate thinking and to argue for an experimental perspective. And then I go into constraints. And the first thing I would say about in constraints, uh, if you have models, you, you like to have kind of linchpins around which you uh, build your data. Any model of carbon-14 day must satisfy certain constraints. First, since carbon-14 dating is objective and reproducible, it cannot be ignored can't just say, oh, they're just making stuff up. Well, maybe some of the time they are, but you, the burden of proof is on you to, to, to show that. One cannot simply dismiss it out of hand. There should be an explanatory model for the data. Second, it has been validated to at least back to 300 BC by comparison with many other reliable dating methods. So I'm comfortable saying that back there, to the limits that the people themselves know of, it works pretty well. Therefore, any model must account for this data, and it is not reasonable to consider carbon-14 dating completely unreliable before that point, particularly when used as a relative dating method. That is, the data there, we've got to explain them. Another universally recognized constraint is the level of carbon-14 in geologically old material. Although the existence of a very low level of carbon-14 in ancient or antediluvian fossil material, for example, Pennsylvanian coal, conventional age, 350 million years, is controversial, see discussion below, it is universally uh, agreed that the level of carbon-14 in such material is at least very low if not non-existent. There's a debate over whether it's there or not, but it certainly is not what it is in, in the modern, um, uh, uh, modern material. And in fact, uh, one can say it's less than, uh, probably co with confidence that it's less than 1% of what we have in the modern material. There are five other less universally accepted constraints that determine which of the eight categories of models will be chosen. One, strict uniformitarianism. Everything is exactly the way it was, and particularly the carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio has been always been the same. Two, what I called in the article the evolutionary, but which is more properly named a standard geological time scale, because it's true whether or not evolution I is true. Three, an invariant decay constant for carbon-14. Four, 
the dendrochronological carbon-14 calibration curve prior to around 300 BC. Do you believe it all the way back or just to 300 BC? And five, the date of the flood and its presumed consequences. How important one considers each of these constraints determines which category of model will be most appealing. Now, I'm deviating from the article itself of putting my own words in. Remember that what is measured in carbon-14 dating is not time. It is the ratio of carbon-14 to ordinary carbon, uh, the carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio. If uh, that's what the data actually is. One has to have a way to translate from that ratio to time if one is going to make statements about time. That is what the various models are all about, translating from the carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio to time and on occasion back. The simplest way to relate the two is to say that the ordinary car pardon me, the carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio has always been constant in the biosphere until an animal dies. Then the carbon-14 starts to decay exponentially so that if you measure the carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio of an object today and project backwards to what is in the biosphere today, you will find the time that has passed since the organism died. That's the uniformitarian model, and it, of course, depends on uniformitarianism. There's always been a constant level, and the decay rate has always been constant. And if you grant those assumptions, you get an equations that look like this. Don't worry, I won't ask you to memorize them. Uh, but there are a few of you who may want to know that. Okay, graphically it looks kind of like this. You have the decay curve, you, you measure the amount of carbon-14, the ratio of carbon-14 to ordinary carbon now. You assume it went back to the, not technically the present, and that gets into a whole different discussion, but uh, you assume that it goes back to the present level, uh, and and then wherever it hits 100%, you drop the line down, and that is your age. And it can be done for any arbitrary percent modern carbon and age. The uniformitarian model is now generally accepted as inaccurate. I won't go into all the reasons. If you're interested, you can read the article I wrote. It gives uh, several reasons. One can find living organisms or the remains of tree rings that lived at a defined time and simply match the measure we have now to, uh, of our unknown age to some of these known age samples and assume that that means that they left the biosphere at the same time. And in fact, that's the way it's done now. Because of that, we don't have to do corrections for the possible change in the half-life because, after all, if you're simply saying that, well, the carbon-14 age matches something that lived in, let's say, uh, 500 BC, well, then that's what it matches, and that must be its age. Although, of course, what do you do if, and this is actually the case, 415 B.C. matches 500 B.C. matches 600 B.C. matches 765 B.C. Now you have a carbon-14 age that could be anywhere in that range. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, all you can say is well, somewhere in that 350-year period. But that is the standard model. Uh, I am here discussing only one particular pr prediction of creationist carbon-14 models, and for these purposes, the actual time since the flood is the only really important variable that determines those predictions. In fact, even a variable rate for carbon-14 de decay doesn't really change what we're looking at. Um, and so I come in... A, a, in the article, the testable prediction number one, discrepancy between tree ring and radiocarbon years. 
It is obvious that the models based on the Masoretic text and those based on the Septuagint require a rapid rise in the apparent carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio immediately after the flood. Measurements of carbon-14 in presumably antediluvian fossil material consistently are less than 1% of the modern um, carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio, except in dinosaurs where they may be up to 7%, and I don't know why that is. Um, even if one disregards the data from the dendrochronological calibration curve before 450 BC, it is still necessary to go from a very low or zero apparent carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio at the time of the flood to near the present ratio in less than 3,000 years. It says, see figure four, and, oh, I don't have figure four in there. I thought I did. Okay. But what is not always appreciated is that the same is true for the ancient flood models. They have been designated, designed specifically to agree with the dendrochronological calibration curve until its maximum age, at least its maximum age at the time that they were written. Uh, it's being extended out further, and so now, presumably, they would have to disagree with it. Uh, although you could always just keep going back and say, well, we'll accept tree rings, but nothing else. That gets a little sticky after a while. Um, uh, if, uh, in the model proposed by Ardsma, if the dendrochronological... Uh, is there anybody here who has a first aid kit in a car? I guess we have somebody who uh, tripped and cut themselves and uh, we need a band-aid. Okay. Anyway. In the model proposed by Ardsma, if the dendrochronological calibration curve at 11,000 years before present requires a carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio, approximately 110% of that at present, and if the flood occurred at 14,000 years be before present, that would should be 12,000 BC, well, actually 12,050, but whatever, then we still have only 3,000 years to reach that level. And uh, I hope we have figure four. Maybe I can drag it up from somewhere else. No matter how it is constructed, any reasonable creationist model must have rapidly rising apparent carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratios after the flood. Ah, uh, and there we are. I think this is figure four here. And as you can see, if you have a flood at 2300 BC, more or less, 2,500 would be here. It doesn't really change too much. Um, you have to have a rapidly rising carbon-14 level to get to where we, uh, uh, pretty much everybody concedes that carbon-14 actually works. Okay, if you're a Septuagint, you have a little more room, but you can see that you still have a rapidly rising rate. Now, does it rise exactly that? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but even if you're doing an Ardsma thing, you still have a rapidly rising rate to, g to get up to where he accepts the radiocarbon calibration curve. So if you find a tree in this area, we, we should be able to uh, uh, do some interesting uh, 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 some interesting experiments, shall we say. Herein lies the first experimentally testable difference between some creationist models and the evolutionary model, uh, called standard geological model, for carbon-14 dating. Consider a tree that is perhaps 35,000 radiocarbon years old. It is not unreasonable to assume that since, according to Genesis 8.22, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, were not to cease while the earth remains, the rings on such a tree must represent a close approximation of the number of years it grew. Since by hypothesis, there is a rapidly rising apparent uh, carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio during this period, 
there would be a difference in the carbon-14 dates between the inside and the outside of the tree that is much greater than the number of real-time years. Therefore, according to any creationist scenario, a sufficiently old tree should have a significant difference between the carbon-14 dates for the inner and outer wood, much more than the difference predicted by standard evolutionary theory, um, I should say standard geological theory. Um, evolutionary theory, of course, is quite happy with geological theory, with the standard geological theory. For Septuagint muscle models, the constraints are tighter than for the ancient flood models, and for Masoretic flood models, the constraints are even more severe. Wood that is 6,000 radiocarbon years old should have this feature for either Septuagint or Masoretic flood models. In contrast, the predictions of most ancient flood models match those of the standard geological model for specimens less than perhaps 11,000 radiocarbon years. The simpler Masoretic and Septuagint models are more easily tested than one might think. Take, for example, a 250 ring specimen from Mount Mazama, that's the Crater Lake region in Oregon, which blew up approximately 5,700 radiocarbon years ago. Uh, those real-time years, we don't know, but that's the theory. If one assumes a roughly exponential rise in the apparent carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio after the flood, this specimen should have approximately 1,200 to 2,700 radiocarbon years difference between the inside and the outside, according to the Septuagint models. The exact difference depends on the rate of rise of the carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio in the post-flood biosphere. According to the Masoretic models, there should be approximately 2,400 to 8,400 years rate of carbon years difference between the inside and the outside, again, depending on the model. An, ev an evolutionary, uh, a standard geological or ancient flood model would predict roughly 150 to 200 radiocarbon years difference between the inside and the outside. And if you're wondering this, uh, calculations I made, I won't present them to you. Your eyes will glaze over. But, uh, but here's kind of the, uh, it depends if you have a, what is the best estimate right now of, of the half-life of carbon-14 <coughs> uh, in the biosphere, 375 years, you get uh, a difference uh, of 1,500 years versus 29 for the Masoretic flood. Now, if, you, if it rises faster, you get a steeper rise during the Masoretic flood model and a steeper rise in the Septuagint model, and the same way uh, if it's slower, then you get a lower rate. Uh, you know, those are relatively, relatively simple to calculate. It is important to note that the argument is not affected whether one accounts for the rapid rise of carbon-14 dates by dilutional effects, by changing production rates, by changing decay constants, or by any combination of these and or any other factors. The simple fact is, if you wish to get from less than 1% modern carbon to greater than 97% modern carbon, the curve must slope upwards. Some may wish to claim that this may not be true for all specimens. The plot of the atmospheric carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio versus time most likely is not completely smooth and may have even have occasional reversals, as it does in the present. But for every part of the plot with no rise or with a reversal, or a slower rise if you prefer, the plot must have an even steeper section elsewhere. For a sufficiently long time period, say 3,000 years, the trend mathematically must be observable. Each of these creationist models is falsifiable, and I'm going to show you figure 5 here. You see here we have one where there's a flat area. And you can see that that just means that you have to go even, I'm sorry, even steeper in the other areas in order to get there. Because you have to get from point A to point B. The simplest way is by an exponential curve, but if you introduce wiggles in the curve, then the curve has to go even, even more steeply if you have some kind of reversal. So you're stuck with that. Some creationist readers may resist the notion of testing our ideas. What if we are proved wrong? 
I would point out three significant benefits of falsifiability. First, testability places one indisputably in the field of science. Creationism can no longer be honestly disparaged as making no testable predictions. It is, or at least can be partly, scientific. Second, to what is our ultimate allegiance due? Is it not to truth? If our beliefs are not true, then why hold them? One cannot ultimately evade the thrust of this question by saying that even if all the evidence is against our beliefs, they are still true. The claim of the Judeo-Christian and Muslim religious tradition is that our God is the God of the universe. If the observable universe is truly understood and does not match some part of our religious tradition, then that part needs modification or revision. Ooh. Third, and most importantly, if creations are right and the results of the experiments corroborate our theories while falsifying those of others, we provide an opportunity for anyone who is honest in heart to see that our theories are more correct than theirs. Let me state this in the negative. If we are right but refuse to allow our beliefs to be tested, do we not give the message to our opponents, perhaps accurately, that we really do not believe? That we actually doubt? And do we not prevent them from ever finding out that we are right? Because they're not going to do the experiments on their own. I see the present situation not as dangerous, but as a win-win situation. If we are wrong, we'll find out. And if we are right, we will pro provide an opportunity to anyone who is honest and hard to see it. We should do the experiments. One point to remember is that the Bible is not determinative for all knowledge. The Bible is not a good manual for automobile repair. The Bible does not even give a clear indication of whether the sun moves around the earth or vice versa. Such indication as was given seemed to the readers to be in favor of the former at the time when a major scientific dispute took place. The best Galileo could do was to argue that the Bible did not intend to address the question. It is certainly possible to read the genealogies of Genesis 11 as incomplete and not specifying the precise date of the flood. Perhaps scientific data, including radiocarbon data, may help us to determine this question. Another point that deserves emphasis is that it is simply not true that whenever the mechanistic view of nature, usually mislabeled science, conflicts with religion, science always wins and religion always loses. Specific cases in point that are now generally conceded are whether the universe has a beginning, whether the geologic record gives evidence of catastrophes, and in the field of history, whether the numbers of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles are accurate. Were it not for the fact that the question strikes at the heart of the mechanistic view, the same would be the case for the origin of life. In the case of Seventh-day Adventists, the same is true for the toxicity of tobacco. Thus, religion is not destined to lose every time it stands up to the current majority scientific view. This means that religion should not surrender too quickly when challenged by what appears to be science. And then I'm skipping over parts two and three because we're not going to be dealing with them today. To summarize, there are several testable creationist models for carbon-14 dating which have implications for biblical interpretation and historical reconstruction. Testable areas include differences between ring years and radiocarbon years in trees that should be immediately post living by creationist theories, the accuracy or lack thereof of the dendrochronological radiocarbon calibration curve in the historical era, which we've done some testing on, and maybe uh, I should bring some of the results of that to you. Um, and three, the possible existence of carbon-14 in antediluvian fossil material. These models should be tested so that we may know which, if any of them, deserve our confidence. And as you can imagine, there is this, um, there's some controversy regarding that position. And in fact, I think it's the only time I've ever seen this done there was a black box warning on that particular article. Literally. 
Um, and here is the black box warning. So you can take it for what it's worth. The editors feel this paper makes a valuable contribution to creationist writing, and we are pleased to publish it. However, we feel that a word of caution is in order. Historical theories are inherently difficult to test decisively because one is attempting to reconstruct initial conditions and the number of possibilities is, for practical purposes, infinite. Even if we can test a few possibilities, there may be too many variables to be able to disprove an idea completely. Furthermore, we have reservations about the power of science to test conclusively historical scenarios in which supernatural intervention is proposed. In historical science, tentativeness of conclusions is always appropriate, and more so when dealing with issues at the interface of science and scripture. With this caveat in mind, we hope this article will indeed stimulate creationists to test their ideas whenever, wherever possible. So, um, they're a little uncomfortable with the uh, approach that I mentioned. Um, now, if you're going to do this kind of thing, what you need to do is to survey the literature and try to find, has anybody done any of this before? Uh, and then, of course, the obvious thing to do is to try to do some yourself. Um, well, I will give you some of the old data that's there. Um, there is a, uh, let's do that. Um, for what it's worth, there's a, um, an article in Radiocarbon, and it's now available on the Internet, as much, most of these things are starting to be. And so you can look it up yourself. And uh, I, I ran into it by doing the old-fashioned way, reading through radiocarbon. But uh, it's a lot easier I just to uh, pick it out of the Internet. Um, and this is one of the trees that they did. They did several trees. And you can see the Borth one tree ring sequence. And you're looking at this and you're going, oh my, what does that mean? And you're right. So I'm going to put that into a graphic form in just a minute. And then there's Borth 6. And you can see there's a whole bunch of these. Um, and then there's Unislas 1. And again, you have an interesting uh, set of uh, uh, tree rings. There's Stolford 4. Um, and then finally, um, hmm, there's Stolford 5, and I don't see, I must have missed putting it in. Um, but uh, there's a general comment. Results of sequential growth increment analysis clearly indicate that short-term fluctuations in natural radiocarbon content of the atmosphere have, appear, have occurred over the past millennia. Variations of 2 or 3 percent over several decades are comparable with those reported by Campbell et al. from similar measurements on a floating tree ring chronology dated from the early third millennium before present. It is firmly believed that detections of these variations has been facilitated by high sampling frequency employed by this study. Instead of just taking the beginning and the end, you take it all the way through. And I agree that any study of that kind is not going to be able to just take something from the beginning takes something from the end, but you're going to have to do um, a series. And here's Borth 1. Now, this straight line here is the uh, is the expected radiocarbon uh, uh, age. That is, see, if you see, this goes from what, z uh, 0 to 90, well, actually from about, say, 7 to about 85. And it actually should slope downward. Well, you can see it goes crazy. It goes way up. Somehow we're getting a lot higher radiocarbon age, and then, and then it comes down again. Well, that's not too encouraging. That doesn't fit anybody's theory. Here's another one. Again, with the expected slope, um, if, 
you know, if the standard uniformitarian uh, school was uh, correct, but you can see going down, up, down, kind of up. Um, if you really want to, you can say, but look, the, the average is actually flatter than one, which means that radiocarbon dates have actually been uh, not consistent with the hypothesis that there should be a greater uh, range. Uh, here's Borth 6. Well, this one kind of looks like it might argue for, although, again, this is crazy data. And uh, this one is actually considerably faster radiocarbon than what you would expect. Uh, there is more radiocarbon date difference uh, between the first ring and the last ring than, uh, than uh, what you would expect from a, a, a uniformitarian approach. Um, maybe that is some evidence, although looking at the other ones, I'm reluctant to put too much weight on it. Um, here's um, uh, Unis Loss 1, which uh, actually looks pretty good if you take that first one off, but if you put that first one on, uh, then it looks like we're getting more of a slope than you'd expect. And uh, here's Stolford 4. And uh, uh, this one is if anything, flatter, but again, with some really crazy, uh, I mean, this is what, two to three times the, the, the normal rate, and then it actually goes backwards at that point. Something fishy is going on, but I'm not sure that anybody can really make too much out of it. And then finally, there's Stolford 5. Well, Stolford 5 is declining from here to here at about twice the rate you'd expect. Interestingly, that's exactly what you would expect, well, within statistical limits, uh, from a Septuagint date for the flood, if you do the, the, the math. Um, it's a little less than you would expect for a Masoretic date for the flood. Uh, one thing that I can't show you because the graphics won't work. Um, eventually, I'm going to try to see if I can do it in Excel and try to make it, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, photograph it for you, uh, uh, screenshot it for you, is that if you take Unislas 1, it fits into this pretty well, except for, I think, one point here where they disagree, but I don't think they disagree by... Uh, the two standard deviations. And so the Unis Loss 1 actually fits into this area right here. So there is some suggestion of the possibility of uh, tree rings uh, changing faster in their carbon-14 dates than the ring years would suggest that you would expect, and it's roughly equivalent to what you'd expect from the Septuagint. Um, it's not as much as you'd expect from the Masoretic. Well, there's some new data that I'm going to show you. It's drawn in a slightly different, uh, it's drawn in the way that we did started with, not in the way that uh, we finished, and this one again is available on the internet. Um, uh, from ResearchGate, um, there there is a longer form that you can get from um, uh, PNAS, I believe, uh, that has the raw data in the back. And um, I'll just read the the abstract. Radiocarbon content in tree rings can be an excellent proxy of the past incoming cosmic ray intensities to Earth. So what they're doing is they're finding abnormalities and they're attributing them to cosmic rays. Although such past cosmic ray variations have been studied by measurements of carbon-14 content in tree rings within greater than 10-year time resolution for the Holocene, there are few annual 
carbon-14 data. That's because in the old method, you had to get enough material to actually do the carbon-14 date. It would take huge hunks of material. Um, and uh, nowadays, with accelerated mass spectrometry, you can use much smaller samples. So it's easy to just take a single ring year and check it out. Uh, there is a little under there's a little understanding about annual carbon-14 variations in the past, with the exception, I think that should read little, but uh, that's the way it came off of the internet. Um, with the exception of a few periods, including the AD 774 to 775 carbon-14 excursion, where annual measurements have been performed. So sometimes they've been doing this. Um, here we report the results of carbon-14 measurements using the bristlecone pine tree rings for the period 5490 BC to 5411 BC, which is easily in our range that we've been talking about, um, with one to two year resolution. And a finding of an extraordinarily large carbon-14 increase, about 20, that's 2 percent, for what it's worth, that's 20 per mil, uh, from five. 1,481 B.C. to 5,471 B.C. Ten years, 2% um, increase in the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, uh, or what they call the 5,480 B.C. event. The carbon-14 increase rate for this, of this event is much larger than that of the normal grand solar minima. We propose the possible causes of this event are an unknown phase of grand solar minimum or a combination of successive solar proton events. I missed taking that hyphen out. And a normal grand solar minimum. So they've noticed this phenomenon and they're trying to explain it by um, extra cosmic ray production by one of these two mechanisms that they mentioned at the end. And here is the data. Now this is again, how we started out and not like the ones in the middle, which are done in a slightly different form. Um, but you can see that these are three different uh, laboratories whose data is, you know, pretty well lined up. I think these are one, uh, one standard deviation. So the actual 95% confidence limits is about twice that. And in fact, if you do a little more reading in the carbon-14 literature, you'll find out the, the true standard deviation is probably more like uh, 2.6 times that. Um, but in any case, you can see that the data you know, is clustered down around here and then suddenly goes up here. Well, this is exactly what we're looking for. But if, and in fact, I could live with this a little bit of a plateau if this kept on going. But they have a bunch of data here. Now what I wanted to do, and I haven't yet done, is calculate, does this mean there is no more carbon-14 being formed anywhere in the biosphere for 50 years? Because that's what it looks like. But I have to go and do the actual math for it. Um, here's their data, smoothed all together, compared with some other people's data that has been uh, sort of massaged. That is, you're never told which exact tree comes, uh, gives you which exact dates. Um, uh, or, and in some cases, I know that in the past, they have taken several tree rings and uh, from different trees and put them together. So I'm not sure exactly how reliable this stuff is. Interestingly, you'll notice that the green dates tend to run lower in this area than the red ones. Again, why is not clear. This blue is their totally massaged uh, calibration curve. Uh, underneath that last figure, it says, uh, measured results of three series that were measured at different AMS laboratories. That's the upper one, which we just talked about. And then lower, which is interesting, comparison of our combined data 
diamond spistle cone pine. The original data sets of the intcal, and they give the references there. Um, and the intcal 13 curve. Although the intcal original data are not consistent with each other, our measured results almost agree with the intcal 13. So let's go back and look at that. So what they're saying is that these data are not consistent with each other. So if you're looking at it and you're saying, that doesn't look right, you're correct. But this was the published curve that they got, and it really, you know, except for this, where we're pretty consistently below the curve, and that's statistically significant. I'm quite sure, having done a few of these, uh, uh, different from the curve that they had before. And this is probably statistically significantly different here and maybe statistically significantly different there. Uh, so we now have uh, conflicting data. This is nice. This is what I would expect. This is not so nice. <coughs> what do you do with it? It doesn't fit the things that came before, so it's not really totally comfortably fit into the standard model. Um, but, I don't know, uh, maybe this one is consistently biased negative for whatever reason. Anyway, they look at it another way, and this, they should have some of these actually dipping down below z one, uh, zero, I think, but I can't, uh, I need to go th through and look at the uh, exact math you can see that the production rate has spiked in this area and then has come back to more of what they figure is the average rate here. But I will have to tell you that this is data that has been run through several different meat grinders before you see it. And I'm going to leave alone the rest of that kind of stuff. I'm just going to say I think the data we have right now is not conclusive. It is suggestive in certain areas. The massage data definitely favors the standard paradigm. And if you think, oh, the, they're doing good work and you don't have to worry about it, well, you'll probably wind up uh, going with the standard science. Some raw data suggests a Septuagint date for the flood. Doesn't prove it. and uh, uh, but is consistent with it and is you know, consistent with what was predicted before they, they got there. And I do think that more data is needed. Um, it looks like um, we'll be able to do, I, I think, about 20 dates on a log. And I'm trying to get one that's long enough that it will make a really big difference. Um, but we will see what comes out of that. But uh, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Um, <clears throat> trying to figure out where you're going here. Uh, we want less carbon-14 in the past. That is correct. Uh, the further back we go, the more rapidly it should decrease. It, yes, and uh, a number of these, uh, your first comparisons showed more carbon-14 in general. Um, uh, actually, I mean, in the second round, I did it off of their, off of their, their date. And so we, in, in that section, we actually want more carbon-14 age, well, which means less carbon-14. You're, you're, you're talking about rapid increases. That's right. Versus total amount of carbon-14. That's correct. I just want to make sure I knew where you were going here. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, if I have... If I had to do it over again, I would probably try to uh, translate the second bunch into the same format as the third bunch. 
but it turns out that the uh, conversion is complex and perhaps more importantly uh, is dependent upon the time that you date the log to to begin with. And of course that's a matter of controversy as well. Um, one of the things, I, I could wish that more things were left in uh, in the format that was with the old data mm -hmm. uh, because it's a little bit easier to intuitively understand um, what the data mean. Um, but if you, you get a little whiplash from going from one way of presenting the data to another way of presenting the data. And um, this stuff, I really wish they had just, you know, given us percentage of carbon-14 and then uh, and then put in another line the date that they think it belongs to and then the uh, delta carbon-14, which is... Uh, the delta carbon-14 is how you make that, that graph that goes back that shows everything flat and then curving down. Uh, I might uh, just comment for, if you believe in a, say, 6,000-year Earth and so on, the rate of carbon-14 production now is, you can't build it up that fast according to the present rate. It would take what a fifteen thousand years or something like that to build up our present level. That uh, is assuming a uniformitarian hypothesis, yeah, and right, I'm not right. ready to do that. In fact, uh, I think one can de demonstrate from present data that the uniformitarian hypothesis is not, in fact, uh, a valid model. Going beyond that, uh, is it possible that? Uh, the Earth was here before then. Carbon-14 did build up. Well, it hasn't built up to its equilibrium constant at present. Uh, uh, that uh, certain factors, really, the flood might have released some stored carbon-14. Uh, that's uh, a possibility. In that case, you should have a sudden jump between pre-flood uh, material and flood material and so forth. And in fact, we may be forced into that because uh, because of the what appears to be the consensus that both dinosaurs and mammoths seem to have a great deal more carbon-14 than coal. Uh, carbon-14 is apparently in coal, or tailored to the contrary notwithstanding. Um, but the dinosaur and mammoth stuff suggests uh, in the neighborhood of 10 times as much carbon-14 in, in uh, mammoths and dinosaurs as there is in coal. And what you do with that, I'm not sure. Um, the dinosaurs all, all, all of a sudden got fattened up on carbon-14, whereas the coal beds somehow managed to escape. Well, it's possible. Maybe in the last few years before the flood, there was a lot of carbon-14, what we have in coal is uh, leftover tree bark that mm -hmm. never really, uh, on, and tree stems and whatever, that never really incorporated that carbon-14, whereas the dinosaurs were eating, uh, if you want to call it that, contaminated food just before the flood. That's a possibility, and it's something we're going to have to consider. Uh, there appear to be some You're preserving two different uh, kinds of organic molecules here. Is that a possibility? Uh, <laughs> there is some selection, but it's not enough to account for that. Uh, the dinosaurs got extra carbon-14 from somewhere, and we just don't know where. I, this is kind of, you know, seeing through a glass darkly, I'll have to say. Uh, because we really don't understand what all that data means. And it, it doesn't fit into anybody's straightforward uh, interpretation. I'm sorry I missed the first part of your remarks. I took a tumble down the stairs oh, here. Oh, I'm sorry to Had to be that. attended to. But uh, 
first a preliminary question when you refer to the Septuagint uh, dating for the flood. Right. Uh, are, are you speaking of uh, a calculation of the sort Bishop Usher made or something okay. different from that? Uh, well, okay, Usher... Usher probably, from the Masoretic text, probably overestimated the uh, date for the flood. Uh, so you're speaking essentially of using the, the I, uh, chronologies? Uh, uh, as you may know, there's in most of the post-flood patriarchs, there's about a hundred years difference between what the Septuagint says and what the Masoretic says. Uh, um, that, that, for example, instead of somebody having a kid at 30 years old, uh, he has a kid at 130 years old. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that, you know, it's simply a matter of going back, finding out what the numbers are, doing the math, and finding out that there's about roughly a thousand years difference, a little more, I think, between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text on the date of the flood. Uh -huh. And uh, there, you also get an extra 215 years because the Septuagint, uh, uh, well, actually, you know, you shorten that because the Septuagint clearly has, the, mm. has uh, Joseph 215 years before uh, mm. Moses and, uh, and the... <coughs> the uh, Masoretic text as, as it reads most straightforwardly, although not completely. Um, my, my real question, however, yeah. is apart from that, and it was this, uh, getting a date with radioactive carbon-14 dating, making allowance for the uh, factor you've been discussing here, on a given site, this is hypothetical, and then in the same site you find rocks using the potassium argon method that give quite a different and much earlier date. Uh, yes. Which would you be more inclined to believe? Uh, that's easy, carbon-14. You, you would be more inclined uh, and, to And I'll it. tell you why. Um, out in... Uh, Utah, there used to be a giant lake called Lake Bonneville. And um, it spilled over into the Snake River. It basically eroded a, a dam, a uh, uh, natural dam. It was a landslide. So it's kind of loose material, and then the lake built up behind it. And then it finally got far enough to where it started eroding, and um, from what I am told by the uh, geologists who studied this, it emptied out in something like 60 days down the Snake River, carving Hills Canyon in the meantime. Um, and a whole bunch of things that are, that are in the Snake River, like giant watermelon-sized boulders of uh, 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 basalt that have been nicely rounded, just fields of them. Um, all kinds of stuff you can show that, uh, that there was a major flood, and it's pretty well accepted by the geologic community nowadays. Um, that flood was attributed at one point to a, uh, the, the final overflow to a, uh, a, a redirection of the Bear River from uh, flowing outside the lake to flowing into the lake. Um, and of course it was kind of important for the geologists to date when that, uh, uh, when that lava flowed, okay? And um, so they found some trees and whatever that had been run over by the lava and, you know, cooked into carbon. And so now you can do a carbon-14 date. And uh, it was about 35,000 radiocarbon years ago, which is easily measurable. I mean, you can argue it's really 35, really 40, but you're not going to argue that it's 100,000 years. You know, 100,000 is beyond the reach 
period. And um, uh, so then some enterprising said, uh, students said, well, why don't we just date the lava? Because it has potassium in it. So they did potassium argon date. And now you're talking 250,000 years. So these nice little carbon-14 things were attributed to spring deposits, whatever that is. Well, think about it a little bit. Um, you know, at this point, the question is, well, do you trust the, the, uh, the potassium argon more, or do you trust the carbon-14 more? Well, it turns out that you can show that modern lava forms that you know, we can date because they flowed in 1910 or perhaps that we're still collecting, you know. Uh, there's an article back in 19, I don't remember, it said, I think it's uh, Dalrymple, uh, who did a whole bunch of just dates on modern lava flows. And there's a significant number of them that that date considerably older than 250,000 years. So to me, if you've got modern stuff that dates to 250,000 years, and you have this stuff that dates to 250,000 years, you have to kind of say, well, 250,000 years really doesn't count. Um, and so I would go with the carbon-14 date as being a more accurate date, although, again, Remember, you're measuring the ratio, you're not measuring the date, and so even that date may have some play with it. Genealogies in the comparison of the Masoretic and the uh, Septuagint, of course, this would apply equally to all of the early Hebrew That's right. or Greek translation. Uh, it's been pointed out that Hebrew chronologies only mention often the more important members of a family line. That is true. And that the word ben, which is usually translated into English as son of, can also, also refer to more descended. remote generations. Uh, the, most, the most obvious example is Jesus, son of David. And everybody knew good and well that Jesus was not the son, literal son of David. Yep. meant the and, descendant and, of David. Well, and then in Chronicles you have, uh, in the case of Jehoiakim, I think it is, a statement that uh, he bore, the word Ben is used there, yeah. and speaking of his great-grandson rather than his immediate right, son. Right, right. But and, again, that would only make a difference yeah. of perhaps a thousand or two yeah. thousand years. Matthew clearly does that. He, he, he stylizes the generations. Sure. No, the, 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 the point that I'm making is, is not so much that it couldn't possibly happen. Um, it is that Okay, well, let's supposing that's true, what does it mean? Um, so you, take this, you can take these Masoretic text and you can do calculations on it. You can take the Septuagint text and you do calculations on it and you get a little different number. There's an extra generation in there too, by the way. Um, and then you can say, well, maybe those, maybe we're kind of vague and maybe we really should be able to go back 12,000 years. And there are people who have argued that. And the most prominent one that I can give you is Gerard Arzma. And a brilliant uh, guy who was doing carbon-14 for a bunch of stuff. I think he worked with ICR for a while. Uh, and tried to, you know, tried to make sense out of all the data that he could. And he did it in, again, he assumed certain things were true. And he assumed certain other things were probably not true. And then he assumed that, that you could get a flood at, and, and the, the data that I showed you for the ancient flood is a approximate model for his theory. Um, so what, I, what I'm doing here is not starting out by saying I know which one is right. I'm starting out by saying, well, here's one possibility and here's one possibility. And how does the data fit into them? And that's, I think, probably a better way of doing it than coming at it dogmatically. But anyway, we have a comment back here. Uh, 
you may have sort of already answered this question to some extent, but I'm just wondering if you could uh, just sort of uh, clearly describe a model uh, for carbon-14 at the transition of the flood in terms of like sequest sequestration of carbon, maybe effect in the atmosphere, uh, you know, in the production of, of carbon-14? Well, um, the simplest model, and it's probably too simple, is that before the flood you had roughly the same carbon-14 production that you have now. Again, that may not be true because of magnetic field problems. But whatever the case is, uh, you just assume that the carbon-14 production has always been constant. And, uh, you know, that's obviously a uniformitarian <coughs> assumption and it obviously could be wrong. Um, but if you assume it, and let's just, you know, go and run with it and see where we get, then what happens is you have a very large amount of carbon-14 in the biosphere. That is, probably more carbon-14 in, uh, in the atmosphere because probably a higher concentration of carbon-14. There is some indication that our concentration today is not optimal. The global warming people will come and take me away at any minute now. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, but for plant growth, apparently you get better plant growth if you have more carbon dioxide, and there is some suggestive evidence that carbon dioxide in the ancient past was higher than it is today. So you have that larger carbon fourteen, uh, larger carbon pool to dilute the carbon fourteen in. In addition to that, you have considerably more plant growth before the flood than you have now. How much considerably? Well, you imagine that all of our deserts are, are, are turned into jungles. Uh, that gives you, uh, you know, rainforest has a lot of carbon in it. And as we're destroying that, we're reducing our capacity to uh, sequester carbon, by the way. Could you also have more flattened continents and therefore more surface area? Maybe the continents covered a greater area, and therefore you had, uh, you know, more surface area for the continents, too. I mean, you can see there's a lot of things that we're playing with that we don't really know, that all we can do is make half-baked guesses and then put, kind of put them in and see what happens when we do that. And I think that if, whenever we're doing this, we have to label this as speculation. Uh, maybe intelligent speculation, but may be completely off base. And, uh, but anyway, if you, if you do that, um, there are some estimates that we had, let's say, um, 100, maybe 200 times as much carbon-14 in the biosphere as we do today. Now, let's just take that and run with it. Where do you go from there? Well, if you have let's say 100 times, just to make the math easy. Um, if you have 100 times the amount of carbon-14 in the biosphere that you do today, then what happens is uh, you dilute the carbon-14 that's being made at the same rate 100 times so that the level you get is less than 100th of what you had today. And of course, it's had not quite a half-life well, if you're, a mass, if you're a Septuagint guy, it has had just about a half-life. If you're a Masoretic guy, uh, it's had, I think, about, I think you could decrease it by about 40% instead of 50%. Uh, but so you're going back to the flood. Uh, now you're looking at, uh, again, just for round purposes, we'll say a half. Uh, so now what you'd expect in pre-flood material would be one two hundredth of what we have today. Um, and then when the flood buries all this stuff, suddenly you're still con producing carbon-14 at the same rate, but the dilution pool has been shrunk by 
some 100 times, and you would expect there to be a relatively rapid buildup. Now, the reason I say it, there's more to it than that is because you can see seesaws in the record that we do have that I think we can trust. And those seesaws actually indicate that at some points there is zero production of, of carbon-14, which makes no sense, unless maybe there are areas of carbon-12 that are relatively deficient in carbon-14 that are periodically belching carbon-12 into the atmosphere. That is, in fact, what's happened in 1940, in, 19, in 1850 to about 1940, where we were burning uh, fossil fuels artificially and actually depressing the, amount, the, the ratio of carbon-14 to ordinary carbon. And then we started doing bombs and all of a sudden it went up to twice the level that it was before and then it's kind of gradually decreased since. We, the, you and I, uh, everybody in this room, is about 115% modern carbon, which means if we were to do the old-fashioned uniformitarian date, we would all date probably 500 years in the future. <laughs> so. Um, how, how much of carbon right now is in plant material, of, of, the, of the biosphere, what percent is in, in plant, do you know? And what percent is in the atmosphere? Ooh. <coughs> there are probably some published estimates of that, and I, uh, the atmosphere contains, uh, I think that the, the, the plant material versus the atmosphere, the plant material contains probably about 10 times at least what is in the, in the atmosphere. The vast majority of, <coughs> of carbon-14 is in, is in carbon-based life. So a flood would really remove a tremendous amount of carbon. Well, that's right. From the yeah. biosphere. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and, and it removes then some from the atmosphere, apparently. <coughs> but, uh, but most of it is just, it was just flat out buried plants and stuff. Right. J just to complicate the picture. Uh, the ocean does have some significant amount of carbon-14. Yes, it in does. It. In fact, a, it may have more than the atmosphere itself. And furthermore, to complicate it a lot more, uh, our fossil material, the coal and oil and so on, is only a very f small fraction uh, of what we have in carbon in humans and uh, coal shales and so on throughout the sedimentary deposits of the earth. Uh, old figures should be about 600 times as much. Uh, as, but I, I'm I've, not, I'm I've not seen <laughs> estimates up to 500. I haven't seen that's, anything beyond that, but true. I'm sure there'll be some other people. Well, and of course, if we discover a new oil field, well, obviously we need to incorporate that into it. And it's uh, it, the it more... Uh, nevertheless, it's a significant figure. <laughs> And, and the other question is, is natural gas actually buried plant material, or is some of that primordial? And uh, this is not a very now, we're, now we're getting into really interesting territory. Yeah, yeah, but there's not a very good popular model, I might state, for uh, primordial. Uh, it's uh, not a popular model, oil. but it it's, is, it is it's, a published it's model. It's there, it's there, it's there. And it's a published model by people other than creationists. So, so it's, I mean, and, and now you can see that the more of these things you have, the more complicated your model gets to be, and the more difficult it gets to be to make really precise predictions. And that's why I'm not trying to concentrate on where did all the carbon go, because I think you know, there's a simpler thing. You start out with this measurement, you end up with this measurement, there's 3,000 years between them, you've got to get there somehow. Because those are not really, uh, unless the measurements themselves are wrong, those are not really subject to any of the model complications 
they don't uh, model complications don't really matter for that particular uh, aspect of it. Now, there is one other complication, and that is that some people have claimed that you can get five to six rings, three rings per year. And that, well, does that happen all the time? Does that happen in nature customarily? Uh, well, was the weather right after the flood <coughs> uh, unusual enough to produce that all the time? Uh, and now your model gets fuzzier and fuzzier. Uh, but I think that that before we just completely write it off, the first thing we should do is instead of thinking of all the ways that, that things could go wrong, I think the first thing that would uh, first order of business is to say, well, what does it show when you actually go out and measure them? That's my theory anyway. Yes. It's good to be back. I've been in Africa teaching science and religion most of the month of March. And that's why you haven't seen me here. Um, I admire anyone with a creationist perspective that tackles carbon-14. <laughs> it's always been a big challenge. Some of you have spent a whole lifetime thinking about it. Um, I understand that one of the major factors for the formation of Geoscience Research Institute was the newly discovered and newly published uh, carbon-14 method. And uh, we were hiring personnel that we thought were highly trained and could uh, tackle that, and we've been trying to tackle it ever since. Which is why Bob uh, Brown was uh, a major part of it. That's right. That and we've had a lot of good people uh, working on that, so I don't in any way denigrate anyone's work on that. I have great admiration for those that can wrap their minds around uh, physics as well as uh, some botany and some paleontology and, and geology and put it all together. A so, um, couple comments. Personal, my father, Alger Johns, taught at Andrews Seminary, and he was the only one that's ever taken or taught a class in chronology. I, I might be wrong. I think Dr. Horn also had a class in chronology, and then my uh, father there may took have been over. Somebody in Europe, uh, uh, Jean Zercher or something like that. Yeah, Zercher uh, was heavy into chronology. I don't know if he taught a class. This was an entire class at the seminary just in chronology. <laughs> so I've inherited by osmosis an interest in chronology. My dad, by the way, would be delighted with their presentation because he was a great fan of the Septuagint. He would have loved that uh, data. That uh, I didn't show it, but there's actually one other log that fits nicely into that log, suggesting that that log is probably real. Yeah. And well, in fact, what's interesting, and I, uh, un unfortunately I couldn't show it here, is that, is that if you take the standard curve and you say, but this area here really didn't exist, somebody that's somebody's smoothing data over to fit, and you, and you take away a plateau, suddenly the standard curve fits that log. Even better. So uh, my dad, uh, I shared some of his research with Robert Brown. I think Robert Brown leaned toward the Septuagint, anything I've seen published by him. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> But I do know that um, Robert Olson, head of the White Estate, was very interested in chronology. And when I shared with him, my dad was deceased by then. When I shared with Olson my dad's research, um, Olson thought, you know, I, I don't want to quote him because he's deceased too, but he seemed to fully accept my dad's findings on Septuagint. And knowing that Ellen White used largely the Masoretic test, text, so with a shorter well, to be figures. fair, she didn't actually use the Masoretic text. She simply used the King James that was Exactly. On it. She got it secondhand. That's the correct way to look at it. So we've had this back and forth. And recently, there's a gentleman, William McGee, a PhD, I believe, Old Testament. He did a study of chronology 
and to see whether there were gaps or not. He wasn't trying to prove Septuagint or Masoretic. He was just trying to show whether there are gaps or not, and he published his research in Answers Research Journal, um, AIG in Kentucky. And this was online about five years ago or so. And he reached the startling conclusion that there's good people on both sides of the idea of gaps versus no gaps. And he, he also analyzed their methodology and he said either group has a very sound biblical methodology. So you can't fault their conclusions based on methodology. You can bring other factors in like tree rings and things like that. So that's just a few observations that I personally have on this subject. Fascinating topic. Paul? I just, just wanted to add to um, uh, Warren's comments here. Uh, it is true that uh, carbon-14 presents a number of significant problems to us, but it is also true that carbon-14 provides a significant amount of data that challenges the standard geological time scale and what is uh, most surprising about this is that they've hardly found any, it depends on your interpretation, sample that did not have some carbon-14 in it. Uh, there's been over 100 samples tested, and every one of them has carbon-14 in it. Every one of them is probably over 100 million years old, and uh, totally disproves the standard geologic time scale on, on the basis of uh, that particular data. Well, as you probably know, I wrote the book on that, or at least the article on that. Yes, yes, <laughs> and, uh, yes and we appreciate your work there. <laughs> it, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, I uh, mm. have been invited to speak to the North American Division and the Inter-American Division oh. uh, on that precise uh, topic. Uh, so, yeah, that, that I, I didn't go into it you know, prediction three, I think, was was the one where I said that uh, we should find carbon-14 in coal under certain theories and that we should look for it because other guys won't. And then I went through the literature, like I did for this, and tried to f find everything I could, and it kind of suggested that there might be carbon-14 in that material. And then... Uh, uh, and then did uh, encourage the uh, ICR to uh, to do their famous or infamous, depending on whose side you're on, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, dates on coal. Uh, I can't claim, quite claim the same credit for the dinosaurs. Those were done by people independently, which is probably a good thing. And but there's now, and there, there's some data in um, in Creation Research Society quarterly on um, on natural gas that fits kind of nicely into that hypothesis as well. Uh, and uh, so it's becoming more and more of a problem for the uh, for the long age community because. How does carbon-14 last for millions of years? It shouldn't, and everybody knows it. Just might add, uh, <clears throat> it's, I feel bad that the ICR and uh, uh, Answers and Genesis Group and so on have uh, decided that uh, rates of decay have changed considerably, yet they seem to not uh, be bothered by saying, well, carbon-14 didn't change, but the others did change. Well, actually, they, they are bothered a little bit by it. They don't want to say that out loud because um, it gives uh, encouragement to the enemies. But, uh, <coughs> um, but when they wrote up their data on carbon-14, they mentioned... Uh, possible ways to harmonize it. Um, and I think that, again, rather than sitting mm -hmm. and making and trying to make sense of all the data we have, I think one of the things that we should do is go out and get 
new data. It's going to be, uh, for example, it's, I think it's important for us to try to see whether, um, whether there's still beryllium-10, aluminum-26, um, I think sodium-23, chloride, certainly chloride-40, uh, no, let's see, 37, 30, 36, chlorine-36. Um, there's, there's several radionuclides <coughs> that happen in in uh, meteor, meteorites, uh, actually they happen in the meteors before they hit the ground because of cosmic rays. And so you can find kind of weird uh, isotopes in the ones that fall nowadays. And some of those have short enough half-lives that you really don't expect them to find, to find them in, let's say, Ordovician meteorites. And there are such things, but from a from a creationist standpoint, one might expect to find beryllium-10. Um, now the question is, is it there? If so, how, how high? Uh, and then to go through some of those other nuclides because it is entirely possible that there was acceleration but it's only of nuclei beyond a certain size or perhaps of a certain complexity or something. Uh, or of a certain half-life or a certain stability. And so uh, it would simply be a matter of going back and looking at those things and doing a test on carbon-14, doing a test on beryllium-10, aluminum-26, manganese-53, iodine-129, I believe it is, and, and so forth. Um, so this is, or it should be, an exciting field. We can start doing research and find out what we can find. And I'm going to tell you something. We have the field to ourselves because the other guys aren't going to touch it. So this will not be a race to see who can possibly, you know, uh, who can possibly, uh, you know, get there first like the, like the race to find DNA and stuff like that, you know. Speak. We have to feel to ourselves, mm -hmm. and and it seems like we ought to we ought to be chasing it. Speaking of fields to ourselves, uh, and get into a simpler level, folks, just go out there and look at those layers, hundreds of thousands of square miles, one flat layer on top of another. True, there are some exceptions, little channels and so on, but. Man, this is not what's going on on the surface of the earth at present, folks. It's a different game out there entirely. It's very obvious. Uh, well, soft sediment deformation. And look at you know, the, six thousand years of sitting there like mud, so that the next layer can come in and dump on top uh, of you and ooze down. And look at the paraconformities. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, it, folks, it's there. There's a lot of data out there that support the Bible. Hi, Paul. Uh, yes. Um, one thing you've touched on, you can elaborate a little more on, uh, you mentioned dinosaur bone. Now, with the discovery of actual biomolecules and proteins and things, can we not take, use the AMS method, the highly sensitive method, can we not extract carefully? And who's doing that part? Creationists ought to be at the forefront of extracting biomolecules from ancient, especially dinosaur bone. And then Can you update me? Are we going that direction? What's happening? What's happening is that there is too much work and not enough people with vision and money. And I think it's more vision than money because I think there's actually money out there to do it. It's just that nobody wants to actually get in and do the, the, the dirty work that it takes because it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It takes a lifetime to, to develop a competence in a good area or at science right now. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, research is very expensive and very time consuming, extremely time consuming. But I am going to tell you this that when they extracted biomolecules from a Mosasaur, and this is published, they found carbon-14 in it 
in amounts comparable to what the paleo group are finding in their dinosaurs. So it's out there. It's just a matter of going out and doing it. I think. I mean, could always be wrong. And if we are, I think we need to know that too. But, um, but the signs are very encouraging. It's just nobody has the wherewithal to actually go out and do it. Um, and, and part of the thing is that people, they not only want to find this stuff, but they also want to find it in a provable form that will just answer the questions forever. Well, what you find out is that if people have a strong enough paradigm, and uh, you know they always accuse us of being that, uh, and it's probably true for, for the majority of us, actually, but uh, I can tell you that um, it's true for them just as well. That there will always be an out. That if you need to find a reason not to believe, you can. And uh, just uh, the carbon-14 in ancient material. Uh, people will say, oh, it's just laboratory contamination. And then when you eliminate that, as two people have felt comfortable doing, um, Kirk Bursch, uh, Bursche, or whatever, however you pronounce his name, and um, Harry Gove, I think, uh, that you either say, okay, well, it was being made there by nuclear reactions, or you say, uh, it was contamination underground. I think that I have the two people reversed. So you see, when you get done, and, and that this is one of the reasons why I think rather than trying to make sure that our experiment is perfect, just do the experiment to start with. And you know, when it gets interesting enough, then more people will dump the funds in. But, you know, that's a... I have a different perspective from average, as you can see. The, the editors of... Uh, 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 Origins were a little bit nervous when I published that paper on carbon-14 models. Uh, you know, I'm fully aware that, uh, you know, sometimes you can, uh, you can explain either legitimately or illegitimately that it doesn't work. Anyway. Very quickly, um, recently they found uh, even red blood cells on, and tissue um, on some dinosaur bones. Anyone has gone into doing carbon-14? Oh, everybody is finding it now that they're looking for it. And it goes back more than just the 75,000. It goes back 190,000, I think, now. So, uh, 190 million, I'm sorry. Just uh, a silly question. Why did they cut through? <coughs> What's that? They, they have sawed through the... Uh, that's a bristlecone pine. That's the one that they actually dated, supposedly. So they had to get... That's why they sawed it through. You see those... Yeah. They, okay. Apparently, they did some sawing. Yeah. Where the, I didn't mean to leave the arrow there, but that apparently is what it's pointing to. Anyway, we'll uh, see you guys next week.